My name is Isaac Montoya, and I am the Director of Marketing here at Upside Technologies. I would like to thank you all for joining us here today for week one of our seventh annual Airflow Management Awareness Month. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we started Airflow Management Awareness Month back in 2015 with the intention to not only raise awareness around airflow management, but also around cooling optimization, thermal efficiency, and overall data center best practices. We have received great support from the industry, and we are happy to be back for another year. I'll be joined here shortly by Lars Strong, Senior Engineer and Company Science Officer at Upside Technologies, who will be headlining today's webinar to discuss data center containment best practices and what to consider to maximize ROI. But before I pass it off, I'd like to go over a couple quick housekeeping items. Um, everyone will be muted throughout the duration of the webinar, but we do encourage you to ask as many questions as you'd like, and you can do so using the Q&A module located in your Zoom dashboard. Um, if you happen to have any technical difficulty, please feel free to send us a message using the chat module um, in your Zoom dashboard, and we will try to help resolve those issues as quickly as possible. As I mentioned, this is week one of our annual Airflow Management Awareness Month webinar series. Next week, we'll be joined again by Laura Strong, as well as Tracy Collins, Vice President of Sales of the Americas at Ecosense, who will discuss how artificial intelligence and machine learning can optimize data center performance. In week three, we'll be joined by Bill Clayman, Executive Vice President of Digital Solutions at Switch, who will discuss how modernization and new digital demands have impacted and changed the data center. And lastly, but certainly not least, in week four, we'll be joined by Mark Acton, Independent Consultant and Non-Executive Director at Ecosense, who will discuss data center risk management and the importance of mitigating risk to maximize res resiliency. If you haven't already registered for those sessions, we'll be providing a link later in the webinar for you to do so if you'd like. Now, a little bit about Lars. Lars is our resident expert here at Upsite and is also a recognized expert in the industry. He has over 20 years of experience in airflow management and cooling optimization. He also holds many certifications, a couple of which being HVAC and IT specialists from the U.S. Department of Energy as a data center energy practitioner. Lars has also spoken at many industry events such as Data Center World, Data Center Dynamics, and many others where he has discussed a broad range of topics, as you'll see here on the slide. As for today, it's worth noting that this is a topic of much discussion and debate, with the biggest question usually being, should I contain the hot aisle or the cold aisle? We have covered this topic on the Upside blog, and it continues to be one of our highest viewed articles, even though it was originally published back in 2014. So we know this is a topic many people are, are interested in, and we hope that we can generate some good discussion and conversation here today. So again, we encourage you to ask as many questions as you'd like throughout the webinar, and we will ask them in the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it off to Lars to get us started. Thank you very much, Isaac. I uh, really appreciate that introduction. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, as you can see, uh, Isaac mentioned 20 years of experience, and I've seen a lot of things in the data center industry and, and really around cooling and cooling optimization. And I really enjoyed talking about it and helping people understand the science behind a lot of these best practices that are out there, as well as dispelling some of the uh, half truths and misconceptions that are out there. So hopefully uh, the detail I'm able to get into today will uh, shed some light on those topics. So we're going to cover uh, the four R's of airflow management <clears throat> concept that we put together to help you through the process. We're going to talk about some of the lesser known best practices. We're going to get into containment best practices and look at some examples. And then really the part of the presentation I really enjoy the most is the science of data center containment and how you look at that, how you look at the different variables in the room and uh, what you need to do to realize the benefits of improving airflow management and in, in improving containment in the data center. And uh, we'll go through cooling optimization, the fan laws and and one of my favorite topics, the four delta Ts. So let's jump right into it. The four R's of airflow management is a concept that we put together to help people get their heads around all these different aspects of cooling. And it's broken down into these four R's, the rack, the row, <clears throat> the raised floor, and the room level. Um, and this helps focus uh, efforts. It's a good idea to go out into the raised floor, <clears throat> do some surveys, and really focus efforts on improving airflow management at, say, just the rack level. 
And then if you happen to have a raised floor to do the same at the raised floor level. And then what we'll be talking about today is the row level. And each of these outer elements, these three R's in the outer circle are ways to improve airflow management. The room level, which they all reference and point to, is a reminder that we need to make adjustments at the controls of the room level to realize the benefits. We might get rid of some hot spots by addressing airflow management at the, uh, at the rack row and raised floor level, but it's when you make adjustments at the room level that you really see the benefits. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Also, the raised floor and the rack level airflow management are really prerequisites for getting the most out of containment. So I've been in a few sites that have containment, but they have perforated tiles in the wrong locations, or they have cabinets that have uh, no blanking panels in them. And that was really kind of some money wasted um, to not address those uh, issues at the raised floor and the rack level first. And uh, if, if maybe um, <clears throat> you haven't done that, you do have some containment in place, it would be good to go back and, and address those. Look at that. So today's presentation is really focusing on the row level. And what does that mean? It means the spaces around the row, the gaps underneath cabinets, gaps between cabinets, open aisle ends and the space above either the hot or the cold aisle. <clears throat> Excuse me. So <clears throat> here's the basic configurations of either having a hot or a cold aisle. You can see quite clearly in this picture, we're doing uh, hot aisle containment. So we're containing all the exhaust air that's going into the hot aisle and channeling it back to the cooling units. That means all the air that comes out into the room, um, this rest of the space is a cold space and the designated contained space is the hot space. And <clears throat> vice versa, uh, cold aisle containment looks like containing the space where the hot cold aisle, is, the cold air is delivered to the face, the fronts of the cabinets. And then the exhaust air just flows out into the room. So that's the, the hot aisle. So just to cover those basics for you, we'll look at a couple more pictures here of hot and cold aisle and, and where air might be going. So, you know, a hot and cold aisle is a standard configuration in a room. And um, a lot of people have hot and cold aisle configuration, but without much containment in place. And since air is invisible, it's hard to see what's actually happening. It can be a lot messier than, than it, it seems. So here we have a cold aisle. This is where the most of the supply tiles are. And it's really where the, the only supply tiles should be. Um, but we also have in this example, some supply tiles in a hot aisle releasing cold air into the hot air path back to the cooling units. We also have unsealed cable openings, which are releasing conditioned air and that air flows through the cabinets out the back and again into the exhaust air return pa uh, path to the cooling units. So it can be very messy. Uh, hot air can flow over the tops of cabinets and a lot of this is invisible and um, addressed by having too much cold air or, or over delivering cold air to the cold aisle to try and abate some of these, these problems. So just because there's, there's no um, problems, no hot spots in the data center, doesn't mean that there's some of these poor airflow uh, conditions occurring. Poor airflow management, the lack of containment can be overcome in a, in a number of cases by having a lot of air and a lot of cold air thrown at the problem, but it's a very inefficient way to do it. So containment gives us the ability to improve airflow management to the degree um, that we can now optimize the space and uh, be much more efficient. And this is the way we really want it to look. We want only cold air to be in the cold aisle, um, that conditioned air, and actually not very cold. You know, a modern efficient data center, the cold air is actually around 75 to 80 degrees, not very cold. And the hot aisle though is very aptly named. The hot aisle in a very efficient data center um, might be 100, 110 degrees, um, a very hot environment. 
So this is the way we want it to be, full separation of cold and hot air. So let's look at a, a couple of the you know, less addressed um, issues in managing air at the row level. And the first one is looking at spaces underneath cabinets. These images are this image on this page and the next page are CFD analysis of a room. And it shows that the warmest intake temperatures to the face of the cabinets in the cold aisle are occurring across the bottom of the cabinets. And this is happening regardless of how much supply air is being delivered to the cold aisle. I have also seen this numerous times in data centers that I've walked through, that the hottest spots are at the very bottoms of the cabinets. And this problem cannot be remediated, fixed by adding larger supply openings uh, or like grills or colder air, you can't get rid of it. And uh, ironically, sometimes that actually makes it worse because the high velocity air coming out of a high flow tile um, can create a lower pressure, drawing more hot air underneath the cabinet. So this is the way it should look. And this is what the CFD analysis shows when that space underneath the cabinets is sealed. Uh, this is a photograph of that space underneath the cabinet being sealed by an under rack panel, just blocking off that space, just preventing that opening from being a path for air to flow from the hot aisle back into the cold aisle. Another important space to see are those spaces in the rows where there's missing cabinets or gaps between cabinets. Again, CFD analysis is showing how hot air is flowing from the hot aisle through the space between the column and the cabinet and causing elevated temperatures just along the edge of the cabinet. Uh, you see this side of the cabinet is actually receiving nice cool intake air temperatures. This is a little warmer, but still much cooler than this edge. You know, and these can vary. Sometimes the hot air will come in and fill and, and, and uh, cause high temperatures across the whole top of the cabinet or some portion of the cabinet. But once that space is blocked, in this case, it's blocked with a uh, rack gap panel, a screen type solution that attaches magnetically and uh, pull, is pulled out to block this space. Now the cold air from the supply tiles can do its job and get to where it's needed. It's an important point to make here is that in both these models, there is the same amount of air coming out of the supply tiles at the same temperature. So just because you have cold supply air doesn't mean you're going to get rid of hot spots. Airflow management can uh, improvements, sealing those gaps can really make a difference to that. Another important consideration is making sure that the aisle ends are even. And this is done in this case with a adjustable mounting post and a rack gap panel to seal up that space. This can also be done with a, a rigid panel, a number of different ways to, to seal this space and align the ends of the aisles so that doors can be added to the ends of the aisle. So let's start going through some of the best practices. <clears throat> Cabinets um, at the ends of the row are the most vulnerable to increased IT equipment intake temperatures because uh, it's very easy for that hot air to flow around the ends of the row and cause elevated temperatures in those cabinets. And you know whether doors are applied to a hot or a cold aisle, they can yield huge benefits. And just doing that alone can really make a big difference. Um, even on uh, cold aisle containment, if there's, if there's not hot air problems, if there's not hot spots in the cold aisle, it, the doors may be very beneficial still because what they do is they contain the cold air in the aisle and keep it from leaving prematurely and flowing back to a cooling unit. All of these things create an environment, create conditions where the cooling can be further optimized, where fan speeds can be lowered further if containment is in place, then they could be lowered if there's no containment. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a lot more detail. So here's some examples of aisle in containment. Um, on the far left here, we've got swing doors. These are 
bi-directional doors that swing inward and outward mounted in a frame. They happen to be attached to a chimney here for a hot owl application. In this image, there's uh, another bi-directional door that attaches magnetically. Uh, these are sliding doors uh, with the transom to match the height of the cabinets. And so these, these doors slide left and right. Uh, this is a single swing or a hinge door. And this door just swings, uh, has one motion out and is hinged on one side for a very tight application, such as against uh, you know, a wall or a column and a narrow aisle of, in this case, just two feet. And then, of course, curtains, which we're all familiar with. These can be um, a way to solve some very challenging problems. Um, they're a less expensive solution uh, to some of the more rigid containment, but they do have their downsides. Um, and uh, they can improve conditions as well. So a number of different ways to address uh, airflow management at the end of the aisle. Let's talk about the top of the cabinets. So. In high density situations or challenging architecture, in rooms where there is uh, low ceilings and the placement of the cooling units means that the airflow path back to the cooling units is quite turbulent, um, it may, might be necessary to install some containment uh, across the tops of the cabinets, either baffles or um, a full roof of some sort. So. In this example, there's a, a full solid roof, and these are happen to be drop away panels that when, if in the event of a fire, uh, these panels become warm and lose their structural integrity and they just get kind of gooey and, and drop out. And uh, that would be the case in, in this example as well, of this, this, this quite wide aisle. Um, and uh, these panels can be configured to uh, fit the width of any aisle. Also in this rigid containment example, just a little side note, uh, panels can be constructed that are the size of each cabinet so that if you wanted to add one cabinet here, this panel could be removed and, and one cabinet could be rolled in, a way to maintain full containment um, throughout the growth of the, the deployment of cabinets. On the right here is an example of rack top baffles and rack top baffles are, are very, useful way to get into uh, the containment world at a relatively low cost and a very simple solution. Each of these is modular. There's one baffle on top of each cabinet and they attach magnetically. So, you know, this whole aisle can be deployed in just a few minutes. And what these do is they prevent hot air from rolling into the aisle and they contain the cold air that's here slightly, but they don't block gaseous fire suppression. And uh, in most cases, uh, the AHJ um, fire marshal uh, doesn't have an objection to these and, and they, uh, the sprinkler is still uh, an acceptable solution for fire suppression. So these can be a really good option for improving airflow management without going to full containment. Here's a few examples of, of hot aisle containment. These generally look like chimneys. Um, in this case, ducted, what we're not seeing is the ceiling. Uh, these could be ducted all the way to the ceiling or they might be a partial chimney just to contain the air and direct it towards the ceiling uh, return. Uh, down here, we even have an example of, you know, a, a very short cabinet with some challenges of open spaces and, and there's a L-shaped jog in the wall here. So the containment has different length chimneys on either side. These, this is that baffle solution applied to a hot aisle where the baffles are now vertical just to direct the hot air uh, vertically and prevent it from prematurely rolling over the cabinets. Uh, and this directs it vertical up to the ceiling registers so the hot air can return to the cooling units. Also, uh, you know, when doing hot aisle containment, in addition to the chimneys that are directing the hot air from the um, hot aisle, the exhaust of the, of the IT equipment into the ceiling plenum, you need to duct the cooling units to the ceiling plenum so that they're pulling the air out of the drop ceiling down into the, uh, the cooling unit. So there's a number of ways to achieve that. Um, either you know bent sheet metal or an extrusion frame that sits on top of the cooling units. 
And of course, these need to have access panels so that um, you can access the filters and other components at the top of the cooling units. So let's now get into uh, some of the science behind these processes. So let's, you know, one of the common questions I get is what's better, hot or cold aisle containment? And um, studies, uh, both theoretical and uh, real world studies have shown that hot and cold aisle containment are equally effective if implemented fully. Um, and that's a big if. If implemented fully, they're equally efficient. And they're really the same thing. All we're doing is separating, creating a defined flow path for the cold air and a defined flow path for the exhaust hot air back to the cooling units. Where you separate it is what you call it. If you're separating it in near the, at the cold aisle level, cold aisle containment, if you're separating it uh, near the hot aisle, on the return path, then it's hot out containment. So let's some, look at some of the benefits of hot out containment. Um, the open area of the room is the cold environment. So when you open the door, you are going to feel the cool side of the, the containment, the cool spot, side of the environment. And, and that can be a big factor for a lot of people. Uh, tours, guests, board members don't enjoy opening a door and getting hit in the face by a hundred, hundred degree air. It just doesn't seem right to them, even though it might be very efficient. When you're doing hot out containment, any leakage from the raised floor, misplaced supply tiles, leakage under uh, electrical equipment, uh, all that leakage just goes and enters the cold space and is available potentially to cool IT equipment. It can flow through the room and, and tile placement is not as critical. It's generally more effective because it's easier to implement fully, um, primarily for that reason of uh, when you do uh, hot out containment, or when you do cold out containment, um, the rest of the room becomes hot. Hot out containment will be more forgiving for the racks and the standalone equipment. This is really um, important for networking equipment that doesn't necessarily have a contained or um, sit in a hot and cold aisle configuration. Uh, the open space is cold, and so you can place equipment anywhere in that space and it'll have some cooling. Hot aisle containment can perform well in a slab environment. Um, and with a well-designed de uh, space, a standard um, grid fire suppression system can be used and installed around a hot aisle containment um, and still meet code. Uh, this enables more surface area, building mass for cold storage in the cold area because the bulk of the room is, is cool rather than the bulk of the room being kept at a hot, uh, in a hot state. Uh, so that creates more ride through in the event of a cooling failure. Benefits of cold aisle containment, it's generally easier to implement. Uh, you don't need the architecture. Uh, that's required for hot aisle containment, all you have to do is slap some doors on the ends of the aisle and, and baffles or a roof over the top of the cold aisle and, and you've got cold aisle containment. Um, it's generally less expensive to implement for that reason. And um, it's going to be easier to retrofit for an existing data center. Some of the challenges of hot aisle containment it requires a contained path for the air to flow from the hot aisle back to the cooling units. And um, that's most commonly takes the form of a drop ceiling used as a ceiling plenum return. Now retrofitting an existing space uh, with a drop ceiling to have a flow path means that you might have a lot of um, dust. It might be a very dirty space up there and that needs to be cleaned as well as effects to the fire suppression system. It might require more gas um, if you are now using that above space for uh, the flow path. And um, high temperatures in the hot aisle, uh, they really get exaggerated. This can be mitigated by, you know, temporarily placing supply tiles in the hot aisle where somebody is working. Um, and other other means limiting the time, but this is this is 
I know this is an issue that very often comes up of why people can't do hot aisle containment or with it, why they won't do hot aisle containment very effect thoroughly. Um, but these issues can be mitigated. I mean, people do work in steel mills that are way worse environments than, than a hot aisle in a data center. So it can be addressed. Cold aisle containment challenges, the remainder of the data center becomes hot, as I mentioned. You just, it, it really becomes an uncomfortable space to open the door to and to walk around. Um, there may not be a suitable temperature uh, profile for equipment for whatever reason is not compatible with, you know, the hot and cold aisle configuration, you know, so that standalone equipment is going to be out in a hot space and it's going to be a little harder to cool. Or if you do cool it, you know, by putting a supply tile, then it somewhat compromises the overall design of the solution and uh, requires consideration of um, fire suppression. So you need either drop away panels or the uh, mechanical system um, mechanical system to open the ceiling upon smoke detection. You know, there's a number of issues around fire suppression. So those, you know, went through that fairly quickly. There's a, a lot more uh, we could get into if you have specific questions about whether to apply uh, hot or cold aisle containment to your space. I'm, I'm happy to get into that conversation with you one-on-one -on -one after this presentation. So let's look a little bit more at the, uh, the configurations here. So again, this, this hot aisle con, um, containment is where we duct the hot air up to a ceiling plenum and that creates a ducted path back to the return to the cooling units. This can also be achieved um, without the chimney. So a lot of the benefits of full hot aisle containment can be realized by just ducting the cooling unit to the ceiling plenum and putting these return grills in the, in the ceiling and not having the chimney. Because if that's done and airflow is balanced well, then that hot air really doesn't want to go anywhere else besides to this low pressure environment created by the cooling unit. And so you'll get maybe 80% of the benefits of full containment, uh, even without um, ducting the hot aisle to the, to the ceiling. This is what it looks like with uh, just baffles and um, just giving that air some emphasis to head in that direction and uh, be sucked up by the return grills. Uh, the benefits of this is that this can easily be installed by site personnel and uh, has a you know very flexible nature that as room conditions change, uh, this can be adjusted very easily. So very beneficial for colo environments. Cold aisle containment, of course, we're containing the door, we're containing the end of the aisle on the cold aisle and putting uh, either a roof on top of the aisle or uh, some sort of baffle to contain that air in the cold aisle. And now the hot air is flowing out and this whole space is, is hot air. And um, all that now freely flows back to the cooling units. So when you have either hot or cold aisle containment in place, the very important follow-up task to that is doing some optimization. Now, optimization is crucial, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, because without making changes to the infrastructure, um, without making changes to the set points, all that's gonna happen is the containment will get rid of some hot spots, um, but it's not going to lower operating costs. It's not going to um, regain stranded capacity. And cooling optimization, it's often an iterative process of making adjustments to the controls, seeing how those uh, affect the environment, letting them equalize and balance, and then making additional adjustments. Also, every time there's any significant changes to the airflow management in the room, the installation of blanking panels alone or moving some supply tiles around or changes to the IT equipment load or location. Some cabinets are decommissioned or a new row of cabinets is installed and commissioned. 
then there's an opportunity and a need really to make adjustments at the controls level to realize uh, and realize the benefits of those changes or to um, make sure that the infrastructure is still matched and tuned to the new conditions in the room. So it's really important, again, because without it, cooling optimization, uh, without it, airflow management is just an expense, really. Um, it's the only way to really achieve a return on investment. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, you, you know, you can't purchase efficiency. Efficiency is something that has to be managed. You can purchase airflow management solutions and improve temperatures, but to realize the benefits uh, at a operating cost level, um, you got to manage that space and, and keep managing it. So I've beat up on that enough. Let's talk a little bit more about how this balancing works. And this starts with a very important consideration which is bypass airflow. And we're gonna look at a number of slides here that show the airflow volumes through the room. So this is a simplified example of a room that has one cooling unit and two rows of IT cabinets. And so generally the airflow, the volumetric flow rate of air through cooling units and IT equipment is, is in North America is considered in terms of CFM, cubic feet per minute. And a cooling unit might have you know, 10, 15, 20,000 CFM. But we're gonna keep the numbers very simple and say that all the air moving through all the cooling units in the room is 10 units of air. So if 10 units of air go down into a cooling unit, 10 units come out. And as long as the subfloor plenum is sealed, if you add up all the air coming out of all the holes in the raised floor, it's going to add up to 10. So in this case, we have two units of air coming out of unsealed cable openings under this row, two units of air coming out of unsealed cable openings in this row, and six units of conditioned air coming out of supply tiles in a cold aisle where it should. So two, eight, 10 units of air coming out of the raised floor. When we look at the cold aisle, we see that this row of cabinets, all the IT equipment in this row of cabinets consumes two units of air. And this cabinet, this row also consumes two units of air. So the demand for the IT equipment is four CFM in this cold aisle, but we're delivering six. So that means there's two extra units of conditioned air delivered to this aisle that's not needed. And that extra conditioned air leaves the aisle as bypass airflow and we get our total of 10 units of air flowing back to the cooling unit. So obviously we wanna seal these bypass openings, right? We wanna block this bypass airflow, absolutely. And do you think that if we seal this opening, these openings and, and block this two units and this units of air, so here's a question to answer, will that affect how much bypass airflow is in the room? It's a trick question kind of, the answer is, well, yes, it, it limits the amount of bypass airflow coming out of the raised floor underneath cabinets, but it doesn't change the amount of bypass airflow in the room. We're now delivering all that conditioned air is coming out of supply tiles in a cold aisle, but the IT equipment still only needs a total of four units. So now there's six units of bypass airflow leaving the cold aisle. But this is still a good thing. We're, we're stepping in the right direction because now we've created an environment where we can make adjustments to the set points and reduce the amount of air moving through the cooling units. Now take it down to five units of air so that we're delivering five units of air into the cold aisle. The IT equipment needs a total of four and we've got one extra unit of, of conditioned air always good to have a little extra for variations in flow rates through IT equipment and have a little slight positive pressure. Um, and now we've reduced the flow rate through the cooling units by half. And that has a dramatic effect on the energy consumed by those cooling units. So let's, um, well, what, just before we go on to that, I want to I say, you know, this is, 
the amount that we can reduce the fan speed is dependent on how much airflow management has been implemented in the room. We couldn't do this if there were missing blanking panels in these cabinets. We couldn't reduce the fan speed by half and get and, and very closely match the flow rate through the cooling units to the demand flow rate of the IT equipment if there's supply tiles in the wrong locations, if there's air flowing underneath cabinets, if there's hot air flowing around the ends of the rows. So the more containment we put in place, the more we can optimize and, and more closely match the flow rate moving through the cooling units to the flow rate moving through the IT equipment. And they are independent. If you turned off all the cooling units in a computer room, all the fans in the IT equipment, assuming they're all in UPS, of course, will continue to operate and they will continue to move four units of air through all the IT equipment. Totally independent of the amount of air moving through the cooling units. And what if you added five more cooling units in this room, there would still only be four units of air moving through this IT equipment. So the amount of air moving through the IT equipment and the amount of air moving through the cooling units is independent and separate. And we want to create an environment where we can as closely match those two as possible. So why is this so valuable to reduce the, the fan speeds? Well, there are the fan affinity laws. And what they show us is that the fan speed is proportional to the flow rate. And so if we reduce the fan speed by half, we get half the flow. If um, the pressure is proportional to the square of the fan speed, so if we reduce the fan speed, the RPM of the fans by 10%, that's a 19% reduction in the um, static pressure. And the power consumed is the cube root of the fan speed. So if we reduce the fan speed by 10%, it's a 27% reduction in the uh, power required by the fans. So uh, how this plays out is if we have a computer room with 10 30 ton units 105 kilowatts by the way and i really encourage everyone to consider cooling units uh, capacities in terms of kilowatts and not tons because uh, it's much easier to compare apples to apples by looking at kilowatts so we've got 10 uh, 105 kilowatt units those can typically have a 10 horsepower or a seven and a half kilowatt fan motor if you're paying 10 cents a kilowatt hour at a 10%, 25 and 50% fan speed reduction, you end up with annual savings of 17, uh, 38 and $57,000 respectively. So these can have very significant numbers. Obviously, if you're paying five cents a kilowatt hour, uh, then this would just be half that. Um, or twice the number of cooling units, then it's twice this. So very easy math uh, for you to do. And we're happy to provide this presentation to anybody that would like it um, to uh, look at these numbers. So another very valuable way to understand cooling optimization is to look at the four delta T's in the room. There are four delta t's in the airflow path as it mo moves through a room now most people will really be focused on one or the other the it people of course are focused on the amount of temperature changes air moves through the it equipment mechanical people are really focused on how much the air temperature drops as it moves through the cooling units but there's two other delta t's that are very important that's how much the air heats up from the time it leaves a cooling unit before it goes into the warmest intake. And how much does the air cool off from the time it leaves an exhaust from a IT equipment before returning to a cooling unit? Now, you wouldn't think that these would change very much, delta T4 and delta T2. And in this example, they're drawn at the same temperature. The air comes out at 75 degrees and the warmest intake temperature to IT equipment is maybe 80 degrees. And that's ideal. The air comes out at 95 or 100 degrees and it returns to the cooling units at around 90, 95 degrees. 
that is the way we would like to have our facilities. However, this is the way they actually are. To achieve a maximum intake temperature of 75 or 80 degrees, as most people do, uh, that requires in most environments, because of a poor airflow management and poor optimization, that requires a supply temperature from cooling units of 55, 60, maybe 65 degrees. That, that 60 degree air often warms up 20 degrees by the time it gets to the warmest intake temperature. So delta T4 is 20 degrees, 20 degree increase in temperature from the time it leaves the cooling unit to the warmest intake. And the exhaust, we know the air coming out of servers is easily around 100 degrees. Then why is the return air temperature at the cooling units often around 70 degrees? Why is that delta T 30 degrees? Why is it 30 degrees colder from the time it left an exhaust to returning to the cooling unit? Well, the answer for, for this one is that uh, bypass airflow, extra conditioned air that didn't flow through IT equipment, cool air that came out of an unsealed cable opening mixes with the exhaust air and cools it off, or too much cold air in a cold aisle, that extra cold air leaving a cold aisle, or a supply tile placed in an open area of the room, that conditioned air comes and flows and mixes and reduces the temperature of the exhaust air. The only way to reduce this delta T is to reduce the flow rate through the cooling units relative to the flow rate through the IT equipment. Delta T4, why does the air heat up so much from the time that it leaves the cooling units before it gets to the intakes of IT equipment is because of exhaust air recirculation. Hot exhaust air is finding its way into the cold aisle flow path approaching the cooling, the IT equipment, and it's warming up, it's mixing and warming up that conditioned air. The, uh, the way to reduce delta T4 is with airflow management improvements, making sure that all the cable openings are sealed, making sure that all the cabinet spaces are, are sealed. And then the focus of our presentation today has been making sure there's aisle containment, doors on the ends of the row, something over the top of the cabinets or containing the hot air so it can't get back into the cold aisle. Um, eliminating exhaust recirculation is the only way to reduce delta T4. You can put all the containment in in the world, and this is one of the most misunderstood concepts in the industry, is that you can put all the containment in you want, and you are not going to reduce delta T2 unless you reduce fan speeds through cooling units. There is no way to stop that extra conditioned air. If there are only four units of air moving through all the IT equipment, but you've got 20, 30 units of air moving through all your cooling units, that extra air is going to find its way somehow um, back to the cooling unit. It has to, and it's going to end up mixing and reducing that temperature. So you put containment in place, then you can reduce fan speeds and uh, optimize the room. So the key takeaways are row level airflow management. It's not all about containment. There's other areas in the in the room, in the row um, that need to be addressed underneath cabinets, between cabinets. And it's surprising um, and, and really uh, impressive to me each time I do it, how much finishing the job, finishing that last 20, that last 10%, how much benefit you get from really finishing the job. Uh, modular containment is really valuable. You can put in those baffles and still reduce fan speeds a great deal. Um, baffles partial containment can easily be 80, 90% of the benefits of, of full containment in some situations. Um, the densities, if they are high enough and the room configurations are a mess, it may be necessary to do full, full containment. Uh, and most importantly, as I've just been you know, focusing on for a while, optimization needs to be part of, of any um, data center uh, management process. It needs to be part of any 
implementation of airflow management improvements. And it needs to be an integral step in any significant move ads or changes. Whenever there's a substantial change in the environment, um, optimization needs to be considered. So with that, I see we've got a, a number of questions coming in. Um, been able to save enough time here at the end of the presentation that we'll be able to uh, address a number of questions. All right, great job, Lars. Um, yes, we have quite a few questions coming in. Uh, for those of you who haven't asked yours, feel free to continue asking them either through the chat or the Q&A module. Um, first and foremost, I will answer. It looks like we've got a few people asking for the recording and or the, uh, the presentation deck. We will share both of these um, in the next within the next couple of days. So please uh, keep an eye out for that email, um, or feel free to email um, info at upside.com or marketing at upside.com directly if you don't see that within the next couple of days. All right, let's jump into them. Uh, Lars, can you speak to the effectiveness of in-row coolers in conjunction with containment versus alternative methods like raised floor cooling? Is one obviously more efficient than the other? Um, great question. Uh, In-row coolers uh, definitely have their place. They are often the only way to say it, solve high density cooling challenges as uh, a room is experiencing greater load than it was originally designed for and the, and the perimeter um, cooling units can handle. Um, then there's also been a number of um, great debates. I've seen some, some long dissertations on whether or not in-row cooling is a more efficient solution. The argument for in-row cooling is that you're moving the air a shorter distance. You don't have to push it through a raised floor and through supply grills. You can just put the cooling units closer to the load, blow the air out into the aisle and suck it off the back. And definitely there are some improvement um, gains to be made there. But of course, you know, what's the right decision depends on the business case and you know what's the environment in the space how dynamic is it uh, are cabinets coming and going you know so in row cooling doesn't make a lot of sense for colos which is a growing segment of the the industry because of um, the dynamic nature of those environments but again it it depends on on the type of colo is it a uh, you know a, a a uh, hyperscale or a scale environment, then, then maybe those customers renting entire rooms in row cooling will make a great deal of sense for them. To the question of containment, in row coolings, in row coolers uh, solutions often require the highest level of containment because they have high velocity airflow through them. And uh, if without, say, a full roof on the cold aisle, um, that high velocity air being delivered from an in-row cooling uh, unit will hit the cabinets on the other side and uh, go up and out and spread all around. And you, you'll likely lose a lot of that conditioned space and, and a lot of that conditioned airflow volume. And, um, and it'll be a less efficient environment without containment. But that being said, you can also do hot aisle containment for in-row cooling. Either one is potentially an option, but I think to answer the question specifically, in-row cooling is more likely to require full containment than, than uh, raised floor cooling. All right, thank you, Lars. Um, next one, how well do curtains do in maintaining cold to hot out differential pressures compared to more rigid containment solutions? Uh, that's a great question and, and one I could spend a lot of time on actually, but I'll try to be succinct on that one. Uh, curtains can do a pretty good job of creating a separation between the hot and the cold spaces. Um, they do not contain any, they do not create any um, differential pressure. They, they cannot contain air to the degree that you create a differential pressure between the hot and the cold aisle, which is what was in the question. But that's not necessarily important. Um, quite often in full containment solutions, there is way too high of a differential pressure created. When you're over delivering conditioned air to a cold aisle and positively pressurizing it relative to the space around it, 
you end up stuffing, pushing, you know, positively pressurizing and pushing extra excess conditioned air through all the IT equipment more than it needs. And that there's nothing particularly damaging or wrong with that, but it does reduce the efficiency. It's, it's a actually bypass airflow going through IT equipment. It's more air than the IT equipment needs. And so you lose efficiency. So curtains, while they won't create static pressure differential, um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. One thing that you can do with curtains is if your say curtains are on uh, con containing a cold aisle and the curtains are flapping and blowing out like a, you know, a skirt standing over, you know, a, a manhole cover, you know, like Marilyn Monroe's skirt blowing out in the wind. If you have curtains blowing out sideways, it means there's too much air being delivered to that aisle and you can reduce the fan speeds or take out supply tiles until those curtains hang straight and the curtains actually become a gauge of what the appropriate airflow delivery volumes are. Awesome, thank you, Lars. Uh, next question, what is your experience on smoke detection in these hot and cold aisles? Um, kind of a vague question. Um, not sure where they're, the person's going with this. Um, not a lot of uh, not a lot to say about that. Let's see. I, I you know one thing I can say is that um, some codes and some the codes have been written with the recommendation that 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 um, the containment be tied into the smoke detection, and some fire marshals are enforcing that, and and others aren't. So it's not a sprinkler based solution, but a um, smoke detection, meaning containment has to get out of the way if there is uh, a detection of the of smoke rather than actual fire and heat, which sets off sprinklers. So there's that consideration. Um, there's VESDA, you know, very sensitive smoke detection solutions, which are often located on the returns to cooling units so that they can pick up uh, something that's happening um, sooner than if they're located in another question in other locations. So uh, I don't know what else I can say about that. Happy to discuss that more offline. Thanks, Lars. Um, Robert, we will reach out to you um, after the presentation if you'd like to speak about that uh, more in depth. Um, next, the next question. Generally speaking, by how much can PUE be improved, uh, percentage improvement, by going from no containment to full hot owl or full cold owl containment in a space? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, fortunately, I'm an engineer, and I get to say it depends. Um, it depends on how bad the PUE is to start out with. It depends on um, how poorly, even without containment, the airflow management is being done in the current conditions. Um, but I will give you some numbers. It, it's quite easy to see ROIs in, in less than a, a year. Um, that if that if the fan speeds are still at full fan speed then there's there are a lot of low hanging fruit and it's very easy to get an roi in in less than a year and very common to have an roi in in less than two years great thanks Lars. um and this was asked during the fan energy savings portion um in this fan energy savings what is the consideration in temperature levels um, yeah, so I had it on one of the slides, but I can sum my whole career into this advice, which is the goal of cooling optimization is to keep the IT equipment happy, the right intake temperatures, with the lowest possible volumetric flow rate of conditioned air, the lowest fan speed, at the highest possible temperature. So, you know, I'm often asked, what's the right temperature set point for my cooling units? Well, the answer is, as high as it can be without causing intake temperatures to exceed your desired maximum. So first step in this whole process is know what your desired maximum is. It might be an SLA requirement or um, a corporate policy for an enterprise facility. Know what that is. Then the second step is know what all the intake temperatures are to all of your IT equipment and I mean all of it, every U space in the computer room. 
Um, and that's most effectively done with an infrared camera. Then reduce the intake temperatures of all the hotspots, make everything as even and as cool as possible by improving airflow management and um, rearranging supply tiles. And then you can begin the process of reducing fan speeds and increasing temperature set points as much as possible. I think that's the best answer, but if there's something specific, of course, happy to go into that in more detail. Great, thank you, Lars. Um, next one, with a limited budget, what solution do you recommend starting with first to have the biggest upfront impact? It, it's either between, and it goes out of this presentation. So, you know, holistic little, uh, the holistic considerations are, uh, it's either addressing airflow management at the raised floor level or at the rack level. Quite often I've seen the most benefits result from making sure blanking panels are installed in every single open use space. Um, really dealing with rack airflow management. It's either that or, or, or raised floor airflow management, making sure every cable opening is sealed and every supply tile is in the right location. And then after that's done, the next place to spend money is on doors. Just adding doors to the end of either the hot or the cold aisle gets you a lot of bang for the buck. And then moving up to the roof and, and either putting on chimneys or putting on a full roof. Great, thank you, Lars. Um, okay, let's move on to the next one. In a small, low-density four-rack server room, are there any concerns about using four in-rack coolers for cooling? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, you know, the the challenges with a very small space are redundant cooling capacity. So it, it's hard to be efficient when you need at least two cooling units for redundancy, you know, meaning one cooling unit fails, you got to have another cooling unit. Um, and so having small in row cooling units can be a, a good way to more closely match the load and not have to have so much over capacity um, to achieve redundant capacity. Uh, so yeah, I think that that can work quite well. Just be aware of the airflow management in the room. And that's a, that brings up another important point, which is the better airflow management is in a room, then the better the ride through will be of a uh, cooling event of, of loss of cooling. Great, thanks Lars. We have another question that's very similar. Um, in a design with in-row cooling units, what do you recommend hot or cold out containment? Is any of them more efficient than the other? Um, no, not really. So. Yeah, like I mentioned in the during the presentation, hot and cold out containment, focusing on one or the other can be equally if efficient if implemented well. Um, ideally, you do you are able to consider the whole picture in the design of the data center, and if if from the beginning the design looks at doing hot and cold out containment effectively and looks at the delta t's in the environment um, then you're able to you know purchase fewer cooling units that are running at a higher delta t and it can be a, a much more efficient uh, solution if it's if it's really done from early on in the process great thank you Lars. Um, do you have any recommendations for containment for under the cabinets? What kind of products to use in those cases? Yeah, there's a number of options out there. Uh, we Upsite Technologies, of course, have a couple of uh, solutions. We've got a magnetic under rack panel that works very well. And um, it's um, a tool free uh, solution for adjusting the height to uh, attach to the bottom of the cabinets and seal varying gaps of varying heights. Um, I've seen people use pool noodles and I've seen people use tape and there's a, a number of different, um, not pool noodles, but you know, pipe insulation. There's a number of different ways to address that. But just, yeah, getting that gap closed up is important. And, and I wanna add to everyone, it just, the best thing to spend money on if is to buy an infrared camera. <laughs> um, before you spend money on anything else, buy an infrared camera. You can get a good infrared camera for, you can get a, a really good one for $3,000 and you can get a pretty decent one for just a few hundred dollars these days. So 
any data center operator that doesn't have a infrared camera on site is, is really missing an opportunity to see what's going on in their room. Great, thank you, Lars. Uh, we are here at the top of the hour. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, so, uh, so let's go ahead and move on. In a cold out containment environment, how can airflow of a rack that has devices with poor delta T be improved? Um, it's cold aisle containment, uh, poor low delta T's. So yeah, the delta T through IT equipment is going to be what it is. Um, and it varies greatly depending on the density of the IT equipment and the, the design of it. Uh, delta T's are going up and up and up by design by the IT manufacturers because the higher a delta T there is through IT equipment, the lower the fan speed and the less energy the fan consumes. Um, so the more of the, uh, the less energy the, uh, the IT component draws. So um, there's really not a need to consider whether something is a high or a low delta T uh, IT device in cold out containment. Um, you just want to contain the space you know, as ASHRAE defines, it's our responsibility to provide the right conditions of air at the face of the cabinet. And it's the IT manufacturer's responsibility to keep themselves cool with that air. So the IT devices, whether they have a high or low delta T, will draw the air through themselves that they need to take care of themselves for the most part. But back to the thing we spoke about earlier, we just want to make sure we're not overpressurizing the cold island and forcing too much air through the IT equipment. So if you're experiencing a very low delta T through some of your IT equipment, it might be the result of overpressurized um, cold aisle and pushing too much conditioned air through the IT equipment. Awesome, thank you, Lars. I think we've got time for one more. Uh, I think this is a pretty good one. Does it make sense to run less cracks at full fan speed or to run more cracks at half fan speed? Yeah, so that is a good one. And um, because of the fan affinity laws, it is uh, significantly more efficient, um, uses significantly less energy to run, say, 10 cooling units at half speed versus running five cooling units at full speed. So yeah, absolutely. If you got the ability to, um, if you got variable frequency drives on your cooling units and you can reduce fan speeds, run them as low as possible um, with as many going as needed to uh, create the, to satisfy the demand and only turn cooling units off if uh, you've gone as low as you can on fan speed with all the ones that are running. Great, thank you, Lars. Um, we do have quite a few questions that we did not get to and I do apologize, um, but we will follow up with you directly after this presentation um, to, to answer those questions for you. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us here today. And Lars, thank you for a great presentation. Again, we'll be sharing both the recording and the presentation deck with you within the next couple of days. And again, we will follow up with you um, shortly on, on the questions that we did not get to answer here live on the presentation. Thank you all. And thank you again, Lars. Appreciate everyone's time. Goodbye.